Hello everyone. My name is Cathy Pilgrim and I'm the Assistant Director General at the Engagement Branch here at the National Library of Australia in Canberra. From wherever you are watching, welcome to this digital only event recorded at the library. Through the internet, we can connect with people and places around the country, but it's important that we take a moment to connect with the people and the place we are in. I acknowledge Australia's First Nations peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of this land and give my respect to their elders, past and present, and through them to all Australian and Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples. In this special online event, journalist and ABC broadcaster Genevieve Jacobs is joined in conversation by former rock and roll promoter, wine merchant and author John Baker and author Nick Place to celebrate the release of John and Nick's book, Stalin's Wine Cellar. This is an intriguing true story that is part history, part travel, part adventure that follows John and Kevin Hopko as they travel halfway around the world in search of a mythical wine cellar. Was it to be one of the greatest wine treasures on the planet or is it just a myth? While this is a story of very fine French wine, here in Australia we also have a thriving wine industry. Just recently I spent a very cold Sunday afternoon at the Desalis Vineyards in Orange, New South Wales. A shout out to owner and winemaker Charlie and son Ben who provided a wonderful experience as we tasted 10 of their beautiful handcrafted wines overlooking their lofty vineyard on Mount Canobolis. So inspired, this weekend a road trip is scheduled to Mudgee with a viticultural history that stretches back to the 1850s. I hope that you too have a chance to explore, taste and delight in Australia's wine growing regions in the near future. But until then, pour a glass of your favourite tipple and enjoy this conversation between Genevieve and authors John and Nick as they journey through some of the details of this fascinating true story in Stalin's wine cellar. A story as rich, luscious and complex as a fine Bordeaux. Hello, I'm Genevieve Jacobs, and it's with great pleasure that I open this discussion with John Baker and Nick Place for a rip-roaring yarn about legendary figures, buried treasure, fast cars, international daring do, and the occasional handgun. The book is called Stalin's Wine Cellar. I'd like to acknowledge that we meet here in Canberra on the lands of the Ngunnawal people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And I extend those respects to the Gundungurra people of the Southern Highlands, where John is, and to the Wurundjeri people of Melbourne, whence Nick comes to us. And hello to you both. Wonderful to have you with us here on the Zoom. Hi, Genevieve. Good to be with you. Thank you. Nick, just before we dive in, <coughs> on the front cover of Stalin's Wine Cellar, it says, based on a true story. Now, how much of what we're about to hear really happened? Oh, that would be a spoiler alert right off the top. So I'm not going to fall into that cunning trap, Genevieve. <laughs> um, but look, it, it, you know, there were sensitivities with this story. It talks about a lot of real people. Um, you know, it's John's account of what happened, which other people might not necessarily agree with that account. So we were a little bit cautious about things like that. Um, you know, I come from a novelist background as well as being a journalist, and there were... There was a lot of times in the story where John was concentrating on the deal, which I'm sure we'll get to in a minute, but so he wasn't really thinking necessarily about what was the architecture like in Tbilisi or what food were they eating or anything like that. He was locked into what he was trying to achieve. So I kind of had to add a lot of those kind of elements. I had to really dig back and work out what would it have been like to be in Tbilisi in, you know, 1998, 1999 and, and bring that place to life. So it was fun for me. It was like, it was journalism, which is what my whole career has been with just, you know, a weird little flourish of my novelist hat on as well. It was, it was fun. Okay. Now, you've, you've navigated that very successfully there, Nick. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so, John, let's, let's set the scene when this remarkable tale began to unfold. You were a successful wine broker with a, a nose for the rare and the unusual, happily running the double bay cellars, and one day the fax machine groans and spits out a mysterious list 
from a slightly mysterious character. Now, now what was it and who did it come from? Okay. Um, the, the character wasn't mysterious, <laughs> although he was colourful. Um, we knew him well. Harry Zucko would come to us with collections of wine and say, oh, yeah, John, they're fantastic. It's fantastic. You know, you have to look at this. And I go, yeah, okay, Harry. Um, so usually over spoke what he'd found, shall we say. Uh, so for him to fa he, uh, fax me a list and on the cover, the only word was int interested was a ridiculous understatement for Harry. <laughs> so obviously he had something that was you know, different and, and unusual. So it was 30 pages um, of a list that the, the names didn't mean much to us. Uh, the dates were so old that they almost didn't mean much to us because in our dealings in Double Bay and when we used to buy cellars from people, you know, we'd, be, we'd be buying wines that were uh, 1980s, 1970s, this sort of thing. So to get dates of 1840, 1725 almost threw us off. And, um, and then the next lit column was... Um, supposedly the bottle size, and they were 0 0.7, 0 0.75, then 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Well, there's no 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 bottles that we know of. So again, that sort of notation really threw us off again, until I finally worked out that um, the, the names did have a meaning if you consider them phonetically. And what had happened, what I'd, I'd worked out um, finally, that when the list was compiled, and someone was reading out the French labels and someone was recording them in Georgian. <laughs> and then when they finally wanted to sell this seller, they translated from Georgian back to English again. So you ended up with a phonetic name. So the great French wine that was in, or one of the great wines in there was Chateau Akem, the great dessert wine, which is spelt small d apostrophe capital Y Q U E M, Akem. And on the list was it was I K E M IKEA. So <laughs> when you go down the list, you've got I K E M, I K E M, IKEA, IKEA. So what, what's that got to do with wine? And it didn't and then finally the penny dropped that how it how it came about. So And and there's another sort of immense understatement here that the distance between IKEA and Dekem is a very, very large one <laughs> indeed, to say the least. I don't think IKEA is selling wine at this stage, but <laughs> no, quite. I mean, it's Johnny, the dedication is to your mother Norma, from whom you get your sense of adventure. So it wasn't just a matter of cracking the code. You were really driven to find out more about this mysterious list, weren't you? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we're running wine shops, and not just Double Bay, we had others, uh, but particularly Double Bay. Our specialty was buying sellers for people. We, have, you know, you want to, in retail, what you want is a point of difference. And uh, we discovered or we worked out the point of difference if you could have old wine, if you could buy a, a seller with very good provenance, you could mark it as a special event and that's what we used to do. And um, so when this list came, came along and we dealt with some great wines of Australia, some of the great wines of France coming out of people's cellars. But when this list came along and I sort of finally worked out what it was. This was no ordinary list of wine. This was a real, this is a real wine treasure, if it was true. So, so and, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't only, just to illustrate that for me, it wasn't only the Akam, it was, it was a lot of other extraordinary Bordeaux appellations, wasn't it? It was, it was a, a, a treasure trove, literally, of almost unbelievable magnitude, which is why there was a bit of doubt around this, because it was, it was literally too good to be true. Oh, yeah. Well, we were certainly concerned that it could be too good to be true. And the source that was coming through was um, colourful and, you know, who knows. But, the, you know, with these sort of opportunities, if you don't pursue them, you don't go anywhere. And, and you're right, there was all the great uh, chateaus of Bordeaux, Mouton Rothschild, Lafitte, Latour, Margot, they're in there. And I, it's in the book, but I can't exactly remember, but it's something like, I think there was seven vintages of Chateau Margaux from 1880 to 1911 or something and four cases of one of those, which is unheard of. And Chateau Latour the same. And so as a wine merchant and most wine people, you'd be lucky to see one bottle of that in your career, mm. let alone touch it or have anything to do with it. Mm. So when this is sort of cases and cases of it, um, it was just astonishing. So, so there's the wine in the first place. And then 
There's the story about how the wine was collected together. Mm. And to do that, you go on to another pivotal and mysterious figure in this story, Neville. Talk to me about the revelation as to what this wine was said to be and how it had come together. Well, Neville Rose, uh, uh, Australian whining, uh, mining person who had an interest in a gold mine in Georgia. And his partner, George, um, who we dealt with, he told Neville, he said, look, we've got this wine cellar we've bought. We bought a, a building, it's a winery, and underneath it we found all this amazing wine. And this was not long after the fall of the um, Berlin, uh, the Iron Curtain, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall. So this is um, Georgia becoming a, an independent country again. And this, so these things were in existence, but basically owned by the state or um, up until then. And then, um, so, yes, yeah, so Neville said to us that um, his information was and, uh, that the wine was originally Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, and I think Alexander III before him. And then when they were removed, shall we say, in the Russian Revolution, became Lenin and then Stalin in charge. And then, then come the um, Second World War, Stalin was very concerned that Hitler was going to overrun Russia so he divided this cellar and imagine what he did with other art, artworks as well, but um, we're an interested in, in the wine. Um, he divided the cellar, we're told, into three parts. One part went to the Masandra Winery in uh, Crimea, which is a national winery. And one part, Stalin secreted off to uh, Tbilisi in Georgia, which is his hometown, where he actually lived just, I think he was, he was born just outside Tbilisi. So this was secreted away not to be found. And he was right, it wasn't found until we were, until we were introduced to it. So even um, Neville and George, they didn't really quite know what they had, uh, but they knew that some, well, they knew the story and they knew why it was there and where it had come from, and they knew some of the bottles were valuable. So they, they wanted a um, million dollars US for supposedly 40,000 bottles. Nick, let me bring you in here for some of that historical context. Now, from what John's described, this is extraordinary. The wine, firstly, in and of itself, is a, a huge artefact in its own right. You then layer some of the history that, that John's just suggested to us on top of that. And the story around it is just dizzyingly rich. I mean, what's the significance of, of this wine in this place with these people? Uh, I think it's huge. I mean, I, I should say, I didn't know much about any of this when I started the book. Um, John has lived a lot of this and is much more uh, versed than I am in a lot of these things. But when I kind of came on to um, the team, I really didn't know much about it. I didn't know much about Nicholas II or Stalin, beyond knowing Stalin was kind of a major figure of history, um, the Great Purge, but didn't really know the details. So it was a lot of fun for me to research all this stuff. I mean, I guess I approached it from the point of view you know, we wanted the book to be a page turner. We wanted it to be a really fun read. We didn't want it to be some dusty archival history book. And we also didn't want it to be some very exclusive wine book that unless you're into really, really top wines, you weren't interested. Like, so I was trying to make a very accessible book really for people like me who would find it interesting, would find the adventure, the amazing adventure it is, but also just needed to be told a few things along the way. So I had a very... um sophisticated method which was I would research the hell out of St Petersburg or Nicholas II or Stalin or Shadow of Cam or whatever then I'd sit on it for a few days and then I would write it down as though I was trying to tell the story at a dinner party <laughs> so um, that was kind of my technique to try and make it very much not you know um, yeah it's not a university textbook it's just like you won't believe how Rasputin fits into this dot 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 <laughs> So, so, John, you're a man for an adventure. You've got this extraordinary story that's been presented to you. So you take yourself and the unflappable Kevin, your associate, into the post-Soviet Georgian Republic, and you refer to that as the Wild West. Tell me why. Tell me what, what Tbilisi, what Georgia was like in those days. Mm. Well, we certainly started off, the, the night we landed, we flew Sydney, I think Singapore, Singapore, London, London, back to Tbilisi, which was... 36 hours of flying or something, as we Australians know. And we arrived at two or three in the morning, I think something like that, and and did customs, or George did customs for us. I don't know how someone does customs for someone else, but they, they do that in Georgia. And um, 
then we drove into town in the black Mercedes with the tinted windows and we were driving along and there's a red light and Nino, the driver, just swerves on the other side of the road, just goes through and he says, you know, we don't stop at red lights. That's, that's for Aboriginals, which is what, how they refer to their locals, okay. you know, the local people. And that was fine. Well, not really, because we're, doing, we're going about 100 kilometres an hour in, in, a, in a city. But that's how, they, that's how Nino drives anyway. And we got to the hotel. That was fine. So we went to bed. And when we got up in the morning, uh, they came to collect us. And as they, walk, as they walk into the hotel, there's a metal detector like at an airport. And, but they, so as they walk in, they put their guns on the table, walk through the metal detector, <laughs> collect us. And then on the way out, they just give them, get given back their guns like their umbrellas. Like there's no, as you do, yes. Yeah, there's no, <laughs> no one was particularly shocked or anything like that. Just, but we were standing there going, oh, I'm not so sure about all this. But you know, we were there, and you know, I mean, this is, and so, so I did refer to it as a wild west. And then we'd be sitting in a cafe or restaurant having lunch, and they just put their guns on the table like someone might put it in a mobile phone. No, you know, so you'd be sitting there. Yeah, Kevin and I had two of them. There'd be two guns on the table, and, <laughs> and we'd be sitting there making polite conversation. Of course, you'd be thinking this is not the way one does lunch in Double Bay. Oh, in the world, no. kind of things, yeah. It was different. <laughs> so you arrived at the Savan Number One Winery, and quickly realised that that the people who ran the winery thought you were actually there to buy the whole thing. But when you finally did get down into the cellars, after a lot of talking and navigating it did start to seem very much like this fabled tale from Harry and Neville might actually be true. So, so describe for me what you found down there in the dank darkness in this Tbilisi cellar. Sure, well, we, by, by the time we got down there, um, and we had a list and we'd gone through the list quite methodically because there's certain wines that represented the majority of the value that we really wanted to look at. Uh, we didn't really need to see this. See, this was only a reconnaissance mission. This wasn't to buy the cellar and move it. This was to try and authenticate, say, you know, is this wine genuine? Um, are they, is the Chem or is the Margot from 1890 a genuine bottle of 1890 Margot? And therefore, does the story stack up? Um, so when we got down there, um, it was very dull light. They had some, a few um, bulbs hanging from you know, cord sort of thing, but we'd taken some lights with us, some fluoros, and we are sort of a bit prepared for all that sort of thing. Um, and it, the cellar was very wet, which was sort of good in that it, it was very good for the corks because a bit of moisture retains the corks, but most of the, a lot of the labels or most of the labels were missing, which of course is a, a problem, but not a big, well, it's a problem. Uh, there's lots of other ways of identifying a wine and the label is, probably not the most important. But, um, but it was damp and wet and cobwebs, some sections had just a massive cobwebs all over them. Um, there was certainly a, a mood that this, this was a, a relic of the past. Now, and I've been in probably a lot of cellars in France, or not a lot, but quite a number, and in Australia. And this was, you know, this certainly, certainly smelt and looked genuine to us. But, but we were very, skeptical about the whole thing i think we're i think we're on an yeah we're on an adventure as much as we were and we thought well you know if it doesn't work out well it's going to be fun <laughs> so, um, yeah so, so what was the likelihood of all these incredibly valuable bottles being drinkable being intact i mean ha there were shelves that had collapsed where did you even start to tell if this was the the real deal with a limited amount of time Buried in a cellar. Um, well, the important point was to inspect the most important bottles. Well, first of all, when we, whenever we bought cellars, like in Australia as well, we'd always have a list, which is what we'd negotiate on for the purchase price. You know, some of the cellars we bought in Australia might be $100,000 or $150,000 or something, and you have a list, and when you go to uh, pack the cellar up or take possession of it, there's always it's what we call unders and overs. There's always bottles weren't there and then there's more of another wine that was there. So you always had to do sort of an adjustment. So we, we had the list that had been translated. Uh, so the, my uh, real interest was to authenticate the list. So I would sort of say, and Kevin being quite clever as Kevin is, um, he worked out how the cellar book worked. And the cellar book, of course, was written in Georgian. 
and he and and um, Quattro, who was very good and spoke quite reasonable English, they worked out how the seller book worked because the seller people were you know, not a lot of help. Mm. And so I would sort of say, um, you know, shelf shelf twenty three. Um, Chateau Margot, what have you got? And I wouldn't even tell them what vintage I was looking for. And Potro and Kevin, would, or Potro particularly, would go down the list and find it and say, I've got, you know, 1896. And I go, and I'd look at my list, sure enough, 1896. And how many bottles do you have? And he'd say, I've got five bottles. And I go, mm, five bottles? Uh, I'd say, could you get them out, please? And he'd get, he'd get them out and we'd put them on a table. And we had fluorescent lights we brought, which we put behind the bottles. Um, so you could see the le fill level and, the, and sometimes the colour of the wine. And if they didn't have a label or didn't have a discernible label, you can, if you um, scrape a bit of the capsule off the neck you can, and shine a, a strong torch, which we also took, of course, you can read the label and Mar it'll have Margot 1896. Again, that could be forged. Um, and at the highest end, sometimes that sort of thing is. But we just went through wine after wine, shelf after shelf after shelf, and wine after wine, and there was just not a mistake, which was extraordinary. Mm. Um, and Kevin, who was more cynical than I was, turned around to me one day and said, I don't believe this. This is so perfect. It's incredible. Um, but there was a lot of staff wandering around not, with not a lot to do because so, um, the winery wasn't operating. So I guess you know, they had plenty of time to... Yeah, you know, to, to look after the place and whatever. Um, but no, we got to the end, we got to the stage and also our purpose was to take 12 bottles home with us so we could take them to respective chateaus and say, is this your wine? I mean, I didn't need a chateau to tell me that like we, we took a bottle of 1870 Chem, for example, and I didn't need a chem to tell me that it's a, it looks like a chem, like it's a it's in a chem bottle of that period. It's the capsule and the cork look. I need someone to taste it and say, this is our wine. And the wines we took, we selected. They had no input into it. They had no, um, yeah, we didn't get wines that they gave us. We, we got wines out of the supposedly 40,000 bottles that we chose. And so... We couldn't have been given dud bottles, well, unless the whole lot were dud, but which we're pretty sure they weren't. Which, which would have been the greatest sort of scam of all time, given oh, what yeah. you're actually yeah. describing you find there. And, and I guess to the, to the value of these, which is absolutely astronomical, because these are wines from the, the, the great Bordeaux wines. And as you say often during the book, the wines are living complex things. And so if the fill level is high and the cork is intact, and these are spectacularly good wines in the first place, there's every chance that there's something extraordinary inside the bottles, isn't there? Yes, but um, in the wine world, and I've been asked this question, would people drink these? Not many of them. No. They no. become collectibles. Yes. And they become so valuable that, I mean, I'd open one because I don't believe in a bottle, I don't believe a wine being you know, still in the bottle. I mean, you want to know what it tastes like. Yeah. And um, so, but a lot of these wines would never be opened and therefore that would never, often wouldn't be tested. But the sweet wines, the Akem, uh, the Sudero, Chateau Coute, those, which are some of the chateaus that were there, sweet wine can last almost forever if it's well kept. Because a bottle of uh, dessert wine is basically alcohol, acid and sugar, which all three are preserved in, in a fashion. So, and when we had a chem taste the 1870 it was certainly drinkable mm -hmm. well, well we'll we'll come in a moment to uh, the most valuable bottle of wine you've ever broken in your life john <laughs> but, <laughs> there's, been few, there's been a few competition for that <laughs> yeah, there's, there's horrendous horrendous value here but nick just to you again as a civilian i mean as you researched this book you would have been struck as i was about this extraordinary thing that john's just mentioned that the international rare vintage wine markets, it's not really all that related to whether anyone will ever drink it, is it? No, it, it seems like, it seems like it really is investors and it really is just kind of a, um, it's really like, I don't know, having the moose head on your wall, isn't it? It's like, hey, I've got this bottle and you haven't. Um, 
I, I would suspect it's a lot of men who probably collect wine <laughs> and a lot of men who have made some money and want to show off how much money they've made. It's a, it's a certain subset of people who seem to collect these things, which one thing I found really interesting is, you know, in researching wine forgery, because they're a classic target for a wine forger. It's, it's all about ego and it's all about money. And if you can pull off the forgery, you know, it's, a, it's almost the perfect crime because if, if you do get discovered, the sort of people you've sold to probably don't want to admit they got duped. So they might not ever even say anything if they know they got duped. So I found that whole subsection of the book absolutely fascinating. John, the, the practical challenges though, back in the Tbilisi cellar in Savan number one, You've, you're intending to take these 12 bottles of wine out of the country so you can have this absolute verification from the various chateaus. It wasn't actually all that easy to discover who in fact owns them, was it? No, um, that was the, one of the tricks the whole time. I, 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 my guess is, and I still actually don't know to today, that I think George was trying to sell, sell the wine before he bought it. He wanted to buy, he wanted, you know, a million dollars, which is, was a lot of money in those days, a million dollars US as well. Um, <clears throat> so he was you know, trying to sell it before he bought it. But there's no doubt that he had a lot of authority when he was there. That the chief, the uh, general manager of the winery and the chief winemaker, Ravaz, you know, when we're in, in the discussion stages and talking about a lot of things, and part of that was in Georgia, so we didn't actually know what the conversation was. Um, but um, he, George, definitely held sway, and his word carried a lot of weight. But sure, it was, um, we weren't exactly sure who we were dealing with here, and that's therefore who was going to pass title to us, uh, which was one of the complications we had. But um, there's a number of complications like that. And I think at one stage, you know, I realised that um, this is difficult. But again, I think, as I said earlier, you know, um, my belief is when you're pursuing something like this, you just push on through. And if, you, if it doesn't work, well, you come to the point where you've got to say, well, this is not working, but we didn't actually reach that point, or not, certainly not at this stage anyway. I mean, all the way through the book, there are these characters who are exceptionally hard to pin down. I and mean, we started with Harry and Neville. We've moved on to Georgi, even Piotr, who is probably the hardest man you've ever met, although thankfully mm -hmm. mostly on your side. Mm -hmm. But did you ever feel that you really knew what was happening through this whole saga or whether there was a risk of you and Kevin being completely used by everyone? No, that was always a possibility. Mm. But again, often in deals in, I think in business and things like this, sometimes you've got to not be distracted by the shrapnel and all the noise sort of thing. You've got to go, well, you know, we want to buy the wine, they want to sell it. As far as I was concerned, that's all that, that mattered at that stage. You just got to push on through. And, you know, if you pull it off, you pull it off. And if you don't, well, you don't. But um, if you're distracted by the complications, um, you, know, you wouldn't probably wouldn't embark on something like this in the first place. And we were crazy enough to embark on it. <laughs> and, and Nick, if I can just interpolate there, I mean, all this riveting story that, that John has, it's a mass of illusions and evasions and dead ends and compromises and mysterious characters. How do you turn something like this into a coherent narrative? Um, with a lot of difficulty. Yeah. I think, you know, one of, the, one of the hardest things for me was actually that a lot of it happened by lawyer letters and email. I mean, once, once John and Kevin came back from, um, from Tbilisi, a lot of it just happened by correspondence. And so that's not very sexy in a book. Um, I didn't want to just have a sort of a chart of emails um, they said that, I said that, they said that, I said that. That was going to be incredibly boring. So that was actually the biggest challenge for me was to, to keep it bouncing through once it got down to legal negotiations, which was, you know, quite a large chunk of the adventure, unfortunately. Yeah, it was a challenge. So, John, you, you did actually manage to get some wine out of the country, just that dozen bottles of wine out of the country. And the purpose of that, as you say, was to take it somewhere like Ikem and, and find out whether this was the real thing with the people who are absolutely extraordinarily knowledgeable. And I, I want you to share the story with us of, of what happened, because this is, I mean, this nearly makes a book in its own right. What, what happened as you, as you took that staggeringly bottle, valuable bottle of wine for testing? Okay, this is one of the more embarrassing parts of the book. But <laughs> on the other hand, as you 
if you read the book, it was for, fortuitous that we did. But we were in London the night before with it, um, some very good friends, wine industry friends, and we had, had you know, a nice dinner and some bottles of wine. And <clears throat> I think we had a, on a six o'clock flight or something like that from London to Paris. And we were, got up early or, and um, got organised and got to the airport and got on the flight and packed everything well as we thought. And we had a wine, I had a wine bag, specific, a special wine bag that I take when I, when I go places um, that holds, I think, four bottles of wine. Yeah, and that one did. And um, so we had the wine in, in the bag to be looked after and precious, preciously. And we got to Paris, Paris got to the airport, Charles de Gaulle, and then we got taxi into town. And when we got to our hotel, we were, all the bags were being taken out of the, out of the, um, taxi and I'd said to Jane, I was, you know, just make sure you keep the wine bag on your shoulder um, because and I'll look after everything else. And in the confusion and probably both of us not being um, quite as sharp as we could have been, the staff the, the, at the hotel grabbed all the bags and put them onto the footpath and at that hotel, the footpath was a bit uneven and one of the bags toppled over and I saw it out of the corner of my eye <clears throat> and I um, and I thought, oh, and it does look, it looks a little bit like the wine bag. Anyway, uh, so I raced over, grabbed it, and but the, the Akem bottle, which was in there with a few other wines, was very well protected, or, and, but it did break. And so and it broke right across the bottom, where the base of the bottle, and it was in a um, like wet, sleeve, wet suit material, which, was, which held it all together. So I quickly turned it upside down and I, so I still had all the, most of the liquid, <clears throat> but of course I had a broken bottle, which, and of course I was in total shock. But, um, but you know, on the other hand, one has to do something, one has to perform <laughs> under this sort of situation. Because we had a appointment booked with uh, Sandrine Gabe, the chief winemaker at Akem, to authenticate this bottle. And um, fortunately, I was still thinking well enough so I raced off and got two little Perrier bottles. We tipped them out because uh, they had screw, cop, screw, cap, screw caps, which is what we wanted. And then we poured the chem, the liquid, into these little bottles. And if you let them overflow a little bit, you can screw the top on. There's no oxygen. No air gets in. And, uh, and I think we both just about collapsed there. <laughs> so I thought, oh, dear, now what am I going to do? And I'm not too bad in... Um, pressure situations, so this was what I consider a pressure situation. So I thought, so anyway, we had the bottles, we had the, the two little Perrier bottles with the, the chem liquid, and we had the bottle, we had the, the, um, we had the neck of the bottle with a cork still in it, with a capsule on it. So it was, we had all the authentic parts. The point was, you know, would a chem even see us still? You know, we had, we're, we're turning up with you know, an antique bottle of a chem and not in the condition that they'd be expecting. So anyway, and I spoke to my friend Jean-Francois in Bordeaux who'd organised our appointment and I told him and, and he, <laughs> he didn't believe it and then he roared laughing because <laughs> as I think he said, all of us in the wine trade have had an accident that we wish didn't happen. So, and he said, look, we've got this appointment at the chem, so we'll go anyway, look, you know, we'll see what, what they do. And I thought, oh dear, you know, I was a bit nervous about this part because... I knew Pierre Leton, who's the head of Chateau Chem. Uh, he'd be there. And he, I'm sure I'm almost certain he'd be coming to have a look and have a taste and all the rest of it. So we got there and we got, finally we went to um, San Gabe's laboratory and took all the pieces out and put the little pair of bottles on the counter. And <laughs> anyway, and um, so there's a bit of horror and a bit of laughing going on. And... Um, so anyway, they tasted the wine and they, Sandrine said to me, you know, what did the wine taste like three days ago? And I told her, we had a discussion about, you know, the actual quality of the wine and she inspected the bottle and all the rest of it. And, um, and she said, no, this is, this is definitely a chem. You know, we were no, no doubt about that. And um, Pierre Leton uh, turned around and, and said to me, he says, well, actually, you're in a way you well, in a way, you're lucky you broke the bottle because we no longer open bottles older than 1945. Yeah. If someone comes along with a, the, the wine like you have, we'd look at it 
and go, you know, or, th or we tell, give our opinion on the wine, on the bottle, and say thank you, goodbye. Um, so the fact that we'd actually broken it meant that they actually tasted it, and that was of, that was absolutely crucial to us because when we valued the, the seller at about seven to eight million dollars, and probably half of that was the value in a chem. There was 217 bottles of Chateau Chem from 19 sorry, from the 1800s and the early 1900s. So it was absolutely crucial that we, these are chems, although they certainly look like it and they had stamp corks and all that, but we needed someone to actually taste it. So has, as life has it sometimes, <laughs> you know, a little bit of accident was, was the best thing that could have happened. Look, and it is an irresistible image, you turning up at Chateau de Chem and, and decanting to mm. Perrier. <laughs> but, but and, and, and the other thing I thought, and actually when Pierre Le Tonton told us about the 1945, he did, he did say, only you Australians would do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if that, he meant only we Australians would break the bottle, but that, I think it, as much as only you Australians would actually attempt to get this wine out of Georgia, et cetera, um, because it does take a certain... I suppose, maybe not devil may care, but uh, ambitious. Um, a certain feeling. American spirit, perhaps. Well, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell people how the story ends because this mm -hmm. is a bit of a thriller. It is a bit of a, a bit of a whodunit and a page turner. So what I would love to hear from you is how the chem tasted. Uh, well, you know, and I'm trying to think about, I don't actually, I do remember but at the time, I think I was in such shock that this had happened that, um, and I think I said in the book, you know, I should have stopped and sat down and done an organoleptic, you know, analysis of the wine and everything, but I didn't. Uh, because I think at that stage, by the time I, and we did, by the, well, first of all, Jane and I tasted it when we were in the hotel in Paris, because I think we we're both under shock and we needed something. Um, and it was delicious. I had never tasted a chem that old. I've tasted some certainly mature chem, shall we say. But it certainly had, it had the depth that a chem has. What it differentiates a chem from most of the other Sauterne houses, it has the richness, but it has this incredible depth of flavour, depth of character. You take a wine like Sudero, which is one of my favourites, it's much more elegant, it's finer, um, etc. Um, but a chem's got an incredible depth to it. And... Yeah, but I don't actually remember much more about the taste of it because yeah, I was, you know, my head was in a different space. <laughs> <laughs> Genevieve, I, I think you, I think you summed it up when during the story by kind of going like that as it was all happening. That's, I think that's where John was at the time. <laughs> yeah. It is. Look, it, it is a belter of a yarn, and I think we shouldn't reveal what may or may not have happened to the wine. And I suppose, John, just to end. What did you get out of all of this? A book, Ikem, a taste of this very, very old Ikem. There's a sweetheart along the way too, because Jane sort of weaves her way into all of this. All in all, it is just a great adventure, isn't it? Well, yeah, it was, it was quite extraordinary to be there. And I'm, I'm, with the pressure of the book and trying to tell the story properly, as opposed to just sort of you know, floating around in my head. The one thing that did uh, take over very much. We went there to buy wine and sell wine and you know, make a profit like it was our business. But the more time, the, more, the longer we spent in the cellar and as the wines became more real and more authentic, you know, I started to really uh, be almost overcome with the history and the culture of what's going on. I mean, I was handling bottles that possibly Stalin or Nicholas II had handled. And, and you made the comment before about wine being alive and organic and it's and to me, uh, a seller like this is a, is a witnesses to history. So while they're, si while they're sitting in St. Petersburg in the Tsar's cellar, or when they go to Tbilisi, you know, the whole history of the Second World War is happening. You've got the Russian Revolution, you've got the First World War, the Second World War, uh, falling, falling the Berlin Wall, you know, extraordinary, it was an extraordinary century. And these wines were sitting there witness to all this. Mm -hmm. So when you're down there handling it, you're living history somewhat. And that, by the end of the, <clears throat> the exercise, although I was caught, of course, still very interested in the wine, I was, I was amazed at the experience and the opportunity and what I was handling and what it actually represented. Um, and that was quite fascinating. So that was a, a huge reward just to be able to do that. 
And yes, we ended up with a book. <laughs> so, <laughs> <many years later. laughs> uh, so. it, it is the most wonderful read. Um, fills one with the desire to go to Georgia as much as anything, because mm. you, you do both describe that beautifully. Um, it's, it, the book is Starlin's Wine Cellar. Um, the guests that I've had with me, the authors, uh, John Baker, to whom this all happened, more or less, <laughs> and, uh, and Nick Place. Look, it's, it's a highly recommended read. I think you don't have to know a great deal about wine to absolutely love the pace and the energy and the intrigue of this one. And, uh, and of course, the big question at the end about what's happened to the wine. Look, thank you both very much indeed for your time. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Jamie, thank you very much. Brilliant. Been a delight to be on the program. Thank you.